Let's dig into the text this morning. This is John chapter 12. We're going to study verses 1 through 11. And so here's where we are. If you're visiting with us, my name is Billy. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself if you're visiting with us. One of the pastors here. And if you're visiting with us, we're, we're doing a verse-by-verse study of the Gospel of John. And where we are in, the, in this journey through this Gospel is we're about at the halfway point of the book. Uh, the first half of John covered almost all of the three years of Jesus' public ministry. And then the second half of the book covers one week of his life. So 10, 11, 10, 11 chapters are all devoted to the last week of his life, the, the week leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. And so the book slows down in a sense. The pace slows down. The focus is refined. And I pray that those things would happen for us too, you know, that, that we would behold the beauty of Jesus and the death he died for us and the new life that he gives to us. So it's important to remember that in the setting for our verses, before we read it, I want to just, because we just, we just forget. And so the setting, remember, for these verses is Jesus has taught Mary and Martha a huge truth that we need to be taking to heart as well, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that whoever believes in him, though he die, yet shall he live, and whoever believes him in him shall never die. That puts Jesus in, co- in a rare company, right? Actually, he's, he's there alone. There is no one else that could be that kind of treasure for sinful humanity. So, so remember that Jesus has been portrayed. He's been displayed in these first, the first half of the Gospel of John. It's again and again and again identifying Jesus as the greatest treasure that we could ever know or have. So please remember that as, we're, as we read this morning. Um, and and uh, remember that he has not only declared himself to be the resurrection and life, he's also raised Lazarus from the dead. Keep that in mind as we read this morning. So the truth that Jesus is proclaiming about himself and the miracles that he does to confirm that truth make him the treasure of treasures. He truly is of infinite worth which is really good news to us because we have the joy for all eternity of getting to know him better. We will never arrive. There's always going to be this delight in learning more about his heart and his love and his plan, his goodness and his mercy. So keep all that in mind this morning. Our text reminds us that the infinite worth of Jesus, though, must be responded to. So you're going to be introduced to two people and two responses to the infinite worth of Jesus. There's really only two ways this text says that we can respond to the infinite worth of Jesus. One is the response of Mary and her heart. it's, It's a heart of worship, thankfulness, and surrender because Christ is her greatest treasure. And it is shown. It's demonstrated. She can't keep it to herself. The second is the response of Judas's heart, and that's a heart that sadly only follows Jesus. He, he follows Jesus, but only to the degree that he can use Jesus to get what he wants out of the world. As we read, do you see if any, be, be, be listening, be asking the Holy Spirit to help you. As you read, do you see any of Judas's heart in your heart? And do you see any of Mary's heart in your heart? And I'm going to just be honest with you from the very beginning. This text laid me out. Because I see too much of Judas's heart in my heart. And, I, I, and this is for a pastor. I've, oh, my goodness, I've been a pastor for a long time. and there's, I just feel like I'm just starting. <laughs> I just feel like I'm just starting. I think I've read through this passage before, and I've really kind of brushed past Judas, thinking I have really nothing in common with him, because I'm not going to sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And I've never looked at what the context is that Jesus is pointing to about Judas's, Judas's heart. There are way too many ways I follow Jesus, 
for what I can get out of him or what I think I can get from him in the world. And that's not necessarily money. That, that can be appreciation. That could be doing Christian service so that I'll, I'll, be, I'll be held more highly in your eyes and maybe liked better by you. There's just too many ways that I serve Jesus to get the world. I want my heart to be more like Mary. And I hope by the end of this sermon, you will want that too. And I'm so glad God gave us this text so that we can not only have an evaluation of where our hearts are, but also inspiration that we can grow in a greater expression of worship of Jesus because he's worthy of that worship. So the main point uh, this morning is... We are called to worship Jesus for all he is worth. And I'm going to bring that out again in just a minute. But I wanted you to, to have that right now. So let's stand as we read God's word this morning in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Before we read, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit that we're not left alone to try to understand this book by ourselves. That you, Holy Spirit, are present with us, loving us, wanting us to behold the glory of Jesus, wanting our hearts to be continually transformed. So even as we just read the text, would you minister to us? Would you convict us where we need to be convicted? Would you encourage us? Where we need to be encouraged. Would you open our eyes a little wider to see the beauty of Jesus and how worthy he is of our worship? In Jesus' name. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, of course, <laughs> and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii? And given to the poor. Well, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the, crowd, when the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. You can go ahead and be seated. You know, the Lord's reminded me lately, and uniquely this weekend, but just I can't prepare sermons without hearing Hugh and Alan's encouraging voices in my, in my ear. Um, if you're new to us, Hugh and Alan are our other two elders. Um, these men have been such instruments of grace in my life to help me grow as, first and foremost, a Christian man, as a, a, a husband who wants to love his wife like Christ more loves the, like Christ loves the church, as a dad, parenting now adult sons and daughters-in-law. As a papa, I really would like to be a papa that, that when my grandkids see any sense of their grandpa, that they're seeing somebody who even in his, old, in his aging loves Jesus more and more and more. Oh, I, I, I want to be that way. And I want to grow as a pastor for you guys. Well, the Lord uses Hugh to show me what faithfulness to Christ in his word looks like. You guys, he's been here 40 plus years in this church. Lots of heartache, lots of sorrow, lots of people departing, not Hugh. The Lord has kept him here, faithful to Christ in his word. 
and for his glory. Um, he's constantly cheering not only me, but us as a team on to not only love God's word and teach God's word with reverence, but also to be governed by God's word. So, you know, I, I made a pledge when I first started serving as pastor here. God, I, I don't want to ever get into the pulpit without being first convicted by what we're studying. Or, and inspired and reminded of the forgiveness it brings and the hope it gives. Well, Hugh reminds me of that. Am I being governed by what I'm presenting to you today? Alan is one of my favorite theologians. You've heard that before. And Alan has been such a blessing as a mentor for me and our leadership team in helping us grow as preachers and teachers. I can't start a time of sermon prep without hearing Alan's encouraging voice cheering me on and reminding me that the main point of the scripture we are studying must be the main point of the sermon we're preaching. And sadly, guys, that's just not done as much as you would hope it would be done. We try to do it here, and we fall short, certainly, but we live in a world that just seems to preach things that are just keep people coming back, tickling ears. And uh, so I'm so thankful for the way Alan reminds me of that. He helps me better see what God's intended redemptive effect for the passage is. Why was God giving this? In all of his grace and mercy, what was the redemptive effect God wants to have in your heart today with this passage? Ellen's helped me so much with that. And he reminds us that as we seek to handle God's word reverently and accurately, we also must handle it proportionally. It's too easy to allow a favorite doctrine to become the main point of a sermon, <laughs> even though that's not the main point of the scripture that we're studying. Like the story of a, an old preacher whose sermon was from 1 Corinthians 15, and he says, For I delivered up to you as of first importance what I also received. Christ died for our sins, and in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he, and he spoke about five minutes on that, and then he spoke 45 minutes on speaking in tongues. <laughs> okay. Okay, hang on. First of all, it's not even in the text there. But do you see a problem with proportionality there? It's just so easy to let a pet doctrine to become what you preach the most. And we want, we want to handle not only the accuracy and context, et cetera, of the scriptures, but Lord, what's the proportionality that you're giving us here? And I'm, I'm telling you that this morning because we're hoping that expository preaching and teaching is actually helping you as a student of the Bible on your own. We're hoping, so there's some, some of these things you may be going, <laughs> can you speed it up here? Well, there's, a, there's a reason I'm doing all of this. Um, because many of your Bibles give a heading for our verses that says something like this, Mary anoints Jesus at Bethany. Look, look in your Bible. Says, do you have that? Put your hands up if, you, if your Bible has that kind of a subheading. Yeah, so a lot of us have that as a subheading. Okay. But did you notice when we read verses 1 through 8, there was only one verse about Mary anointing Jesus. Out of the remaining seven verses, five of those verses are about Judas rebuking Mary for anointing Jesus. And then Jesus is rebuked. Of Judas. Okay, so in this text, because five verses are devoted to Judas and one verse is devoted to Mary, is the main point only found in what Judas did? What do you think? No, you're right. You're right. So, so okay, proportionality isn't always related to the number of verses. I guess that would be one way to try to see it, but it's not the only way. Mary's worship of Jesus is, is what is being looked at proportionally, okay? Mary's worship of Jesus is proportioned according to the infinite worth of Jesus. Mary's worship of Jesus is, is proportional. It's not out of proportion the way she's going to be accused of in just a minute. This is the way someone should worship the king of the universe who died for our sins. Do you see where I'm going with proportionality there? I think that's what the text is doing here. Though there's only one verse about it, her worship is so lavish and so appropriate that in Matthew 26, which is a corresponding account of this, of this event, Jesus says that what Mary has done here will be remembered wherever the gospel is preached from generation to generation. So that's the main point of the text, right? And here we are, 2,000 years later, 
I mean, would Mary just, like, if she, you know, it's, these are weirdest thoughts, but I just think Mary would go, this is wild. People in 2023 are remembering something I did just for the glory of Jesus. What a deal. <laughs> I mean, just what a deal. But it's such a big deal, isn't it? And it's going to be a bigger deal in the world we're living in. Because the, just the, you know, I mean, we're moving toward a place where it seems like there's going to be growing persecution of the church here in the United States. But the problem that church faces in the United States is not persecution, it's seduction. You've heard us say that before. It's, it's, it's maintaining a belief in Jesus, but we're really being more and more conformed to the morals and ideas and values of the world. And somebody who worships Jesus for all he's worth stands out like a bright light and draws people to Jesus. Seems like the Lord devoted five verses to Judas to provide a sober warning of how dangerous and ultimately deadly, remember his end, how ultimately deadly it is to follow Jesus only because you want him to give you what you truly treasure. And that's something from the world. And it doesn't even have to be the evil thing. It could be a good thing, but you want the good thing more than you want Jesus himself. It can be deadly. So I want to ask you, is there a correlation between your worship of Christ and the worth, the worth of Christ? Just kind of start thinking now. Let's start making some application right at the very beginning. Do you find a correlation in the, your worship of Jesus with the worth of Jesus? Is there a relationship between your affections for Christ with your valuation of Christ? Is that happening for you? Is there a correlation between your exaltation, your praise of the Lord with the excellence of the Lord? Is there a relationship between how much you trust Christ with how much you treasure Christ? I think those are all things that God is wanting to bring to bear in our hearts and inspire us and give us grace to grow in because we are called to worship Jesus for all he's worth. There's the main point. We are called to worship Jesus for all he's worth. Point number one, let's focus on Mary. We worship Jesus because he's worthy of our worship. That's why you come to this church, right? It's for brilliant statements like, like that. And yet, oh my goodness, it's a, it's a good statement, isn't it? We worship Jesus because he's worthy of our worship. So this is six days before the Passover, the sacrifice. Man, remember, this, there's a buzz in the town. About 250, the estimate is 250,000 lambs are going to be sacrificed in Passover. Because of all the people coming in for this festival, this feast. It's a reminder of the innocent blood that was shed to set God's people free from their slavery to Egypt. Oh, but there's not going to be a Passover like this one. This would be a Passover like none other. Because on this Passover, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, he is going to be killed. So Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem. He knows what awaits him there. And he set his forehead like flint. Nothing is going to keep him from the cross. That's how much he, he loves God. He wants to honor God with his life. But that's how much he loves you. Nothing is going to keep him from dying for your sins. And so as he is making his way there, there's a dinner given for him. In the home of a man that the book of Matthew says is named Simon the leper. So what is this? this is a, quite a dinner party, which means that this is a leper Jesus had to have healed because he couldn't have hosted a dinner party, right? He would be unclean. But he's obviously healed. Wow, what a dinner. Simon healed of leprosy. He's at the table. Lazarus raised from the dead. He's at the table. And as tempting as it could have been to focus on those two, the text doesn't focus on those two. Um, and, and, and what Christ did for them, it would be totally appropriate to, to focus on them. But the focus is on what Mary did. And that's what we're supposed to be learning about. 
As we mentioned, what she did was intended to be remembered. It was intended to be admired. It was intended to be imitated wherever the gospel is preached from generation to generation to generation until Jesus comes again. So here should be the question. So what made Mary's worship so memorable? If it was supposed to have that kind of generation after generation impact, what made it so memorable? I'm glad you asked. Let's look into it. Well, let's look first. Mary's worship of Jesus is remembered because it involved an unconditional sacrifice. At a dinner gathering like this, it wasn't uncommon for the host to put a little perfume on the head or neck of the guests because there was plenty of body odor. Uh, coming off the guests, especially if it was a small room, I get embarrassed. I, you know, listen, for any of the, you who... Um, you know, you kind of have a no-shoes kind of policy, which is great because shoes are so gross, and I understand that and everything. But if I, I come, I am so embarrassed to take my shoes off because my feet stink. I use odor eaters, and they haven't invented an odor eater that is able to keep the odor from odoring <laughs> for me. So life was life then like it is now, and, and so... It was, that would be a common cultural courtesy to give, and it was kind of refreshing to give a little dab of perfume, the back of your neck, on your forehead, um, to bring a little bit more pleasantness to the room. But she did more than just extend a traditional or common courtesy. What she did wasn't spontaneous either. I, don't think, I think the text doesn't give us that. It says, because of her growing love of Jesus and her growing understanding of who he is and why he came, she planned this. And the way, I, the way I'm getting that is look at verse 3, the word therefore. She is going to do this because of something that was already existing in her heart. What's already existing in her heart? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in him will never die. And I don't deserve that. I deserve to die forever. I deserve eternal punishment because of my sins. He, 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 he shows that he has power over death in raising Lazarus. So she is prepared to worship him. When we come on Sundays, do you, does it take like till the second or third song where you finally get warmed up? Shouldn't it be that we come into this room? Now, listen, listen, I understand three-year-olds and poopy diapers, and I can't believe I just said poopy. Um, but it's, I, it's, Sundays can be crazy time, crazy town. Jen and I ended up driving different cars just because it was so crazy, and it just kept us from fighting on Sundays, you know. I mean, it just, it just there's so much crazy stuff. So you come as you are. So always come as you are. But wouldn't it be a great thing is if we came with an intention of being poured out before the Lord in worship and praise and poured out for the edification of our brothers and sisters of the Lord. So we're even learning that this wasn't just a spontaneous thing. This was something that was in her heart. This is something that had grown to exist in her heart. So in other words, because the dinner was a celebration that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, She's ready to publicly express her love and devotion to Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of sinners. We know it wasn't just a dab because we, if you cross-reference it with the book of Mark, it says she broke the container. She didn't just put the stopper out and do that little, <laughs> little thing like we do with the anointing oil, you know, just a little dab and, you know. She broke it, meaning that it all comes out. A tenth of it doesn't just come out. All of it comes out onto his head and onto his feet. The other Gospels may show that there was, it was his head also. Well, thanks to Judas and his love of money, we learn that this was no ordinary perfume. Judas estimated it to be a worth of 300 denarii. A denarii was equivalent to one day of salary. 300 denarii, guys, was essentially the salary of an average worker saved up. One year. One year worth of safe salary. 
So I don't know what that is for me. I Googled what's the average salary for a, an average worker in Midland, and I got several different numbers. In Midland, that would look like today about forty-five to fifty-five thousand dollars, somewhere in there. Wow, that's some perfume. That's some perfume. And in probably less than five minutes, it's gone. It's gone. The alabaster vial, the other gospel accounts bring that into it. It's telling us that this probably wasn't just a financial sacrifice. This is probably you know, it's, it's some, an heirloom that I just treasure. This, this ring, you may wonder where this ring comes from. I usually, I just would be a guy who would just wear a wedding ring, but... But this was my, I, I call it Jiddo's ring. It, it's my grandfather. It's from Damascus. And this ring is, I don't know, a hundred and some years old. So here's my dilemma. I have three sons. Do I give them thirds? I don't know what I'm going to do with that. But when my dad gave me this, I can't tell you what it meant to me. The sentimentality, the thought of losing it would be, I, I mean... Uh, but so it's not just financial treasure, it's sentimental treasure. It maybe was passed down as an inheritance from parents or grandparents. We don't know if these are rich people or not, but even if they were, this is likely their emergency fund. This is likely their retirement account. This is likely some symbol of financial security. And, you know, you guys have heard me say sometimes, I just sometimes I get a little worried about, you know, here's the economy, this and that, and I've got a retirement fund, but it seems like sometimes it's losing more than it's gaining, and, and just how easy it is to try to, to think my financial security, my security in anything is going to come from this world? No, it's going to come from the Lord. And in less than five minutes, it's gone. It's gone. What this act was declaring that Jesus was worthy of her living a life of unconditional sacrifice in her love and service for the Lord. But how many of us, we have conditions about how much we're going to serve Jesus. We just have conditions. And, and, and some of listen, we're not going to go haywire here. I'm just asking about your heart. I'm not recommending any certain practice. I'm just saying what is in your heart? What's ruling our hearts? Do we have these conditions, these lines we've drawn? Well, the house was filled, the scripture says, with the smell of the perfume. But even more, it was filled with the aroma of her unconditional love and sacrifice for Jesus. And isn't that what heartfelt worship is supposed to do? Heartfelt worship of the Lord is never merely relegated to personal and private devotions. It's where my dad and I used to argue. Son, my faith is personal and private. Dad, no one would ever get saved. If it was just personal and private, you are, you are not understanding. Dad, we grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and we loved green chili. New Mexicans love green chili. I love green chili. It, there was a place called Philomena's in Los Alamos, and we used to go to Philomena's because of the great green chili. And I can remember my dad. Man, he would, he would tell people about Philomena's. And I would say, Dad, you tell people about Philomena's, but you don't tell people about Jesus? Something is wrong. It's supposed to spill over. Our worship of the Lord is supposed to have a fragrance, put in quotes, but it's supposed to be recognized, not because we're trying to get anybody's attention. We're living the normal Christian life, but it's supposed to spill over onto others. That's what the text is saying. This lavish, heartfelt, sacrificial, grateful display of affection was for Jesus. Her worship was her witness. Have you ever thought of that? We think of, of our witnesses just, let's give the gospel, let's give the four spiritual laws, however you give the gospel. But, but her worship was part of her witness. And it was, the, it, was, it was a witness to the world that Jesus is the greatest treasure. And you can have him as your greatest treasure too. I'd love to introduce you to him. He will be the greatest treasure you will ever have or ever know. And everybody was blessed. Get this. Everybody was blessed with that fragrance, even Judas. That's something, isn't it? That the one who didn't, no one in that room deserved the grace and mercy of Jesus. 
But here's one we know is going to betray him. And even he, the Lord's love for the sinner is amazing, isn't it? Our witness for Christ is to be experienced, whether it's by somebody who already knows Jesus and needs a little inspiration, or it's the worst sinner of the world. Our worship is to be a fragrance of his worth. Will you and I be remembered for our worship of Jesus? If, if your funeral, oh, God forbid any of this stuff, but if your funeral was tomorrow, would your kids, would, would, would your kids say, you know what's most memorable about my parents? Was the worship of Christ that they gave. They literally didn't have any conditions on serving him. They didn't place any conditions. It was unconditional sacrifice. I want my, I would love for my life to be remembered like that. Do the, how about this? Not just personally. Can I ask us a question as a family? When people visit us, do they experience that in our worship? How about our children? Do our children see that Jesus is worth unconditionally sacrificing our lives for in an act as acts of worship? Do our children, do our teenagers see that? And do the new attenders see that? Mary's saying that I'm willing to give up anything for you, Lord. I will follow you no matter the cost. It was interesting that several commentators blended this with what we're going to sing in just a few minutes. Take my life and let it be. And they said that they see such a correlation here between the line that says, take my silver and my gold. Not a mite. Would I withhold? Well, Mary's worship is, of Jesus is remembered for its unlimited devotion. Mary not only pours out all the perfume, she specifically is remembered for pouring out the perfume upon Jesus' feet. And at that time, uh, in this culture, dealing with people's feet was very demeaning. If you showed care for someone's feet, it was either because of your amazing humility and servant-heartedness, and, and love and preference of others above yourself, or it was because you were being treated harshly as a slave with no rights. And that would be slavery like we would think of slavery in our, the early days of our country, or trafficking, sex trafficking, and all those kind of things. But it, in the New Testament, when being a servant is talked about, it's not mainly describing that harsh sort of slavery that we would think of. If somebody fell into debt in those days, you guys know this, there was a way to handle your bankruptcy by voluntarily placing yourself as a servant of the one you owed the money to, right, in order to repay your debt. And in doing this, you would lose some rights. But the rabbi said that the Jewish servant kept some rights, and there were some things you would never ask a servant to do. And one of those things was, was that they would never be required to touch someone's feet. Or untie someone's sandals. Now, I hope scriptures or other scriptures are coming to your mind, right? John the Baptist, I'm not, I'm not fit to untie his sandals. Get ready for John 13, because guess what's coming, right? Jesus washing the disciples' feet. That should make John 13 even more amazing to us. Mary is saying that I know that even a servant has rights, but as an act of worship, I surrender my rights to Jesus. My Lord and my Savior, I give up trying to be the master of my life. I give up trying to be in control of my life, trying to control other people, using control as a means to try to keep me from being hurt by people. If I can control people enough, maybe I won't be hurt by people. Maybe I won't be so disappointed by people if I could just control the world. Oh, gosh, like a mad scientist. It is mad. Oh, Jesus, my devotion to you is unlimited. That's what this is about. There's nothing that you cannot ask me to do. I've not drawn any lines or limitations to how or when I serve you. Have you done that? Is there any way in your life right now that you've drawn lines or limits to your serving or, and worship of Jesus? I, I just, oh, I hate these examples because they just, you know, you would have every right to say, what are you doing as our pastor? When I first went into ministry in New Orleans, um, I, had, I had done college ministry, you know, and I had, sadly, I think I had 
a ministry, a, min a view of ministry like I had a view of business, that you climb the ladder. Oh, God. And essentially, I, I saw the cross as a way of climbing the church ladder. The cross is not a way of climbing the ladder. It's a way of being emptied and falling on your knees before it, not climbing it. And so I'm, I'm there at Lakeview, and, and I'm just going, look at me. And there was no place for me to serve. Because, well, in the places I thought that somebody who did college ministry should be serving. One day, I get a call and say, oh, there's a place that you could serve. Well, what is it? Seventh grade Sunday school. <laughs> I didn't do very well, did I? But I did it. Thankfully, the Lord was working in my heart. And then you would think I would learn my lesson. Um, because you see where I'm drawing lines. I don't have unlimited devotion to Jesus. I'm drawing lines. And so time goes on. We had a youth pastor, and we, get, we got a youth pastor. He's the guy that I told you that the offering would always come in in higher amounts than when I received it. Um, and that youth pastor left, and our, our uh, other elder, Peter Davidson, he led the youth. And Peter was probably 60s at that time. And, uh, and so you know, here I am. I'm now leading the college and career ministry. Well, Peter comes into staff meeting one day and says, I think my time leading the youth is done. Billy, I think you're supposed to do it. Here I go again. Isn't that going backwards? I'm at the college and career level. And I went and talked to a friend of mine named Joe Champion. He pastors a, a giant church now in Austin. I'll never forget what Joe told me. He said, Billy, I've wrestled with that too. And he said, I had this moment with God where I had to pull off the side of the road. I was weeping so hard. And God was telling him, Joe, if I asked you to wash a toilet in my name, it would be an honor. If I ask you to serve any breathing human being, regardless of age, it's the, it, you should feel almost exalted. to tell you that. I'm hoping that I'm learning those lessons, you know. You know so if you want me to go work in children's ministry, you tell me. And I hope I'll do that. Do our children, do the next generation, do our new attenders experience our worship as a church family like that? That we're a people who are not perfect at this and we're growing. We're not, you know, this is a growth issue, not an arrived issue. But are we growing? To have a worship that is understood and known by other people as having unlimited devotion. Mary's saying, I'm willing to give up anything for you. I, I'm not going to claim any rights in following you. I will follow you no matter the cost. And Mary's wor worship of Jesus is remembered for, oh my goodness, hang on. I've just been preaching and I got way ahead of my notes. Wow. Wow. So, here's the, <laughs> I hope it made sense. Um, so, in take my life and let it be, this is a beautiful line. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. And Mary's worship of Jesus is remembered for its unashamed adoration. She wipes his feet with her hair. And to do so, she's got to unbind her hair and let her hair down. If a married woman did that in public, it would be grounds for divorce. If a single woman did it, it would be considered scandalous. In that culture, when a woman let her hair down, uh, it was a sign of expressing specific and loving and adoring intimacy to her husband and to her family. It could be her kids. It could be the extended family. But this is, this is home. I'm home. This would, this would be done only with those closest to her. It would be an expression of how much you mean to me. You're my family. I'm safe with you. I can be vulnerable with you. I delight in sharing my heart with you. Brian Chappell tells a story of this, this woman who is 
at a park and she's playing with her kids in the playground and she sees a car pull up and this young lady gets out of the car and chapel, the, the lady says she literally skips. <laughs> I'm going to need knee surgery if I skip. Um, she literally skips to a picnic table, a just beautiful scene, trees and a lake and just picnic table there. And she is so happy that this woman is going, okay, I want to keep an eye on my kids, but I want to keep an eye on her because I want to see who she's coming to meet. Is, is she coming to meet an overly busy husband who finally they've, been, they've made time to be able to just spend time together? Is, is, she, is she maybe awaiting that marriage proposal? And she's so excited that maybe this is the day. And, 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 and that guy's going to come and he's going to get on a knee and he's going to propose. And then she said, oh, gosh. And then I, she wondered, oh, is this a bad thing? Is this, she's coming to meet like, a, a, there's like fornication, adultery going on here or something. And so she's wanting to see, but no one's coming. So she's focusing on her kids. And finally, she looks over, and there she is. No one has come. She's going, why was she so excited to go be at that picnic table at that place? And she looked closer. She was reading her Bible. The story gets me because of this unashamed adoration of Jesus. And the good news is that we should be growing with that, right? Guys, I think too often we talk about those things like, remember the good old days of our, of our being saved? Remember the good old days when we skipped to the picnic bench and read our Bibles? Husbands, I would say this, please give your wives time to do that. Uh, you know, if, if your wife is a stay-at-home mom, she's working at home, um, you know, you have lunch hour that you can skip to a picnic table. <laughs> your wife has a lunch minute they, they need time. Give them time so that they can skip off to meet with the Lord. When was the last time you found that kind of delight in him? This unashamed adoration of him. It's possible to just have this works-based relationship with Jesus. You may tithe off your income. You may volunteer some time now and then at church. But sadly, you can do all those things without worshiping. You can do all those things without it being love. This is an expression of love. Unashamed adoration. That's why I do these things. We don't do these things because of delight. It's just possible to just go through the motions. And God is, God is saying, oh, it's so much more wonderful if you are consistently experiencing my love for you and consistently expressing your worship, your unashamed adoration to me. She, she wants others. She doesn't care who sees this. She wants her to people to know who her greatest love and delight is in. Will our worship be remembered like that? Do our children, are they growing up in that culture? That's the gospel culture we pray that we have, or we grow to have. We, do, do new attenders experience that with us? Or do they see us when they come in? Do they see us just essentially standing and, and essentially behaving in a way that we would at a movie or at some concert or some athletic event is there any any expression i'm not i'm not trying to focus on how to hey hey would you get more expressive i'm not just saying that what's going on in our hearts are there moments of your life where there is unashamed adoration of him take my life song would be this take my love O oh lord i pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Well, the warning is, is next, and these, we'll go through these quickly. We must guard our hearts against loving the world and using Jesus to get the world. Judas strongly rebukes Mary for what he considers to be religious fanaticism or an expression of worship that is way out of proportion. And that's where, guys, I think sometimes we may find ourselves a little more in common with Judas, when we somebody see somebody who is just yielding their life to the glory of God, and we're not, sometimes instead of saying, Lord, what work do you want to do in my heart, we just kind of push it away and judge it. I think that's what, Jesus, that what Judas is doing here. But before we think this is just a Judas problem, Mark 14, 5 puts it in the plural, they rebuked Mary harshly. It means to bellow with anger, 
snort or roar like a wild animal. Um, But Matthew 26 gets more specific. And you can look at this on your own, but this is in verse 8. Get get this. When the disciples saw Mary do this, they were indignant. Saying, why this waste? That was the disciples. That's why I tell you, I find too much in common with Judas. Judas. In other words, it seems the whole room is against her. These are not unchurched people. These are religious people rebuking her for her unconditional sacrifice, her unlimited devotion, and her unashamed adoration. They're saying that this is foolishness. This is religious fanaticism. This is over the top. This is way out of proportion. There's our proportion word. Well, the Bible drills down to tell us why Jesus was so angry about what she did. He wasn't concerned for the poor. It's because he was a thief, had control of the money bag, stole from the money bag. And can you imagine how much money he could have made off of the sale of that perfume? Judas did not follow Jesus because he worshipped Jesus. Jesus. He followed Jesus for what Jesus could give him from the things of the world. And the things of the world were his truest treasure. See, do you see the contrast that is being made? There's Mary and there's Judas. And where are we? It just seems like there's just two paths. Are you using God or loving God? Do I follow the Lord as long as he blesses me and makes me successful? Are your prayers mainly filled with requests or rejoicing? We pray. God says, give me your requests. But are you mainly asking and asking and asking? When was the last time that you spent extended time just worshiping? You are worthy. I don't want to leave this this place. You are worthy. Thank you for what you've done, saving a sinner like me. Praise you. I surrender all. I mean, when was the last time you had some time like that? Has it been recently? So I'm a little concerned that some of you may have never experienced a time like that. Oh, how we long. Listen, if you want, I mean, Sundays we hope that could be a time like that for you, that you would... Not worry about getting to your next thing, but I'm going to respond to the King of Kings for what he's just spoken to my heart. And I'm going to ask him for change, but I'm also going to praise him for who he is. If, if you want to come when we're at the church and you just want, hey, can I come and just hang out in the sanctuary and, and just t- spend time worshiping the Lord? Let us know. Come and do it. Have you ever had the thought, what good is it to believe in Jesus when everything's going wrong in my life? Why should I keep obeying God when it seems that obeying him actually makes my life harder sometimes? Those those thoughts give some diagnostic, right? To why we're following Jesus. Mary pours out about $50,000 of perfume to honor and glorify and worship and surrender and adore and love and delight in Jesus. Judas sells Jesus out for a profit of 30 pieces of silver, maybe $3,000. He makes three, he makes three thousand dollars selling out Jesus. Are there any ways you're selling out Jesus to get the world? Jesus rebukes Judas not only to reveal his sinfulness, but he also didn't want Judas's worldliness to infect Mary's godliness. In verse seven, you see that Jesus says, "Leave her alone." I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm raising my voice because that's the sense of the text. It's like Aslan, for those of you who are Narnia lovers. Can you picture just Aslan roaring, leave her alone? Because he didn't want his ungodliness to corrupt her pure heart, her worshipful heart. And Jesus says, she's keeping this. I'm doing this so she can keep it for my death. Well, keep what? The the perfume's already been poured out. I think this is what he's wanting to keep. So that when when Mary sees Jesus hanging on the cross, she keeps believing in him. She keeps treasuring him. She keeps trusting that he is the resurrection and the life. When they bury him, she keeps believing in him. And Jesus rises up with a roar and protects her faith so that she'll go on believing. Oh, Lord, 
I don't want to be more like Judas. I want to be more like Mary. And so here's how we close. So listen, I would be a, such a rotten pastor if I just, this was the close. Okay, so go be like Mary. Have a good day. I hope you have a good lunch. I'm, and I'm sorry sometimes when, when I do that. I think I do that sometimes. I think that the text is really more bent on how can we worship Jesus more like Mary worship Jesus. First, and you can write these out. I didn't put them in your notes. I would meditate on the power of Jesus over death. Meditate on the fact that he is the resurrection and the life. And that was surrounding that whole dinner. Simon the leper is there. You know, leprosy was used by um, people to illustrate. I mean, they, they found an illustration in leprosy of the a way sin works in somebody's life. You know, a hand is, you know, without leprosy, all of the nerve endings are working well and everything. But let's say leprosy begins to come in. And, and it's possible for somebody who has significant leprosy in their hand to reach down thinking they're going to get something that was kind of next to the fire. And they're looking this way, and their hand actually goes into the fire, and it, and it burns, and they don't even know it. And isn't that what sin is like? That, that there was a, there's a time when your heart is tender, and you're very easily convicted, and you're grateful. And, and, but there are times when we keep giving in to sin that we get numb. And that numbness can be perilous, can't it? Meditate on Jesus being the resurrection and the life for you right now. Remember, that's what we studied when we studied John 11. I would encourage you, memorize Ephesians 2, 1 through 7. We were dead in sin and transgression, but God is rich in mercy, and he made us alive together with Christ Jesus. God's already given us an amazing resurrection when he called us and saved us, when he, when he made us to be born again. We've experienced that. Meditate on it. Meditate on That was the greatest power you'll ever experience. God just putting your body parts together when for the final resurrection is not going to be anywhere near as miraculous as God overcoming your enmity to him and your selfishness. And, and that was the greatest miracle, and he had no problem doing it, didn't he? Lazarus, come out. Irenio, come to me. Right? You remember that day, Irenio? I mean, you had no ears to hear his voice. And then for what? why on a significant day you're hearing the gospel and now you're hearing him say, Irenio, come to, come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. Oh, my goodness. Okay, keep going. Meditate on the person of Christ and his personal care for you. By spending time at his feet. Listen, we can't even get into that, but Mary, in, in the instances that she's revealed to us in Scripture, she's always at Jesus' feet. So here's Mary and Martha, right? Scene one. Martha, Jesus, <laughs> don't you care about me? Remember that? I'm doing all this work for you, and my sister is sitting at your feet. Scene two. Here is, here's, Lazarus is dead, and Mary comes to Jesus, and she says, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. The next thing it says is, but she falls at his feet. She falls at his feet to say, I don't understand what you're doing, but I understand that you're good. I understand that you're God. I understand you're the resurrection and the life. So I'm going to worship you even when I don't understand. And then this last with the, with the perfume. She's at his feet again. Please, guys, spend time at his feet in your prayer life, in your personal devotions, in your discipleship group ministry on Sunday mornings. Now, God wants us to experience his nearness and his personal care. Can you imagine what Mary experienced when she is weeping at the feet of Jesus? And the next thing, this is just imagery. So this is, but can you just imagine this? The Bible says Jesus wept. Remember I told you it was ugly tears. So this, these are tears flowing off of his face. Can you imagine Mary bowing down at his feet and starting to think, is it raining? It's not raining, Mary. It's Jesus giving you personal care, identifying with your sorrows so you could, you could behold his glory. And meditate on the priceless death of Christ for your sins. 
the, the text indicates that there was a real understanding that Mary had some idea that he was going to die. And so there was some meditation. She was purposeful. She was intentional. One of the other passages say that she anointed him for burial. We did that on Good Friday. We beheld the cross. We beheld the beauty of our Savior Jesus. We beheld his beauty. And we lingered there, didn't we? We didn't run off. We lingered there. Let's, let's let Charles Spurgeon close us. This is in your notes. Let me affectionately warn you. It is a grievous thing when we can live contentedly contentedly, without the present enjoyment of the Savior's face. Let us work to feel what an evil thing this is. Little love to our own Savior. Little joy in his company. Little time with the beloved. Sorrow over your hardness of heart. But do not stop at sorrow. Remember where you first received salvation. Go at once to the cross. There and there only can you get your spirit quickened. No matter how hard, how insensible, how dead we may have become, let us go again in all the rags and poverty and defilement of our natural condition. Let us embrace the cross. Let us bathe in that fountain filled with blood. And this will bring, back, bring us back to our first love. This will restore the simplicity of our faith and the tenderness of our heart toward Christ. Stephen, do you want to come and, and maybe close us with take my life and let it be? You see that last verse there, Luke 7, 47. That was another Mary who did something similar to Mary of Bethany in regard to just lavishly worshiping Jesus with unconditional sacrifice, unlimited devotion, unashamed adoration. And it says, really, what, what, is the, what is the key to loving Jesus more and more and more and then loving others more and more too? It says that he who loves much has been forgiven of much. Y'all, haven't we been forgiven much? Isn't it great to think about that in the days ahead, the more we meditate on the beauty of his cross, the more we'll behold him for who he is. And the more we'll love him in a manner that he deserves and that he's worthy of. Would you stand?